Um, so just as people are, um, are taking their seats, just a couple of words. So I'm Sarah Bermeo. I um, was able to organize this panel with um, sponsorship from DCID and DUSIGS and the Trent Foundation. And so I just want to say thank you to them as well as to all of the people who have helped organize this for us. I'm going to turn it over to Tony Pippa, who will moderate our panel, who is uh, uh, doing work on global development at the Brookings Institution. And we're going to try to, so just to kind of entice you to stay in your seats, I've asked each panelist to keep their comments to eight minutes so that we'll have plenty of time for question and answer from the audience. And I've asked Tony to rigidly enforce that. So we should have plenty of time to hear from you too. Okay, now I'll turn it over to Tony. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah said, I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. I apologize for my other two Brookings colleagues who couldn't be here today. They couldn't get out because of the weather, but I am the Duke graduate, so I somehow found my way here off the tarmac. Um, uh, having said that, I'm sorry that uh, Scott Morris, who's waiting on video, wasn't, wasn't able to join us. Um, he got stuck on the tarmac, and somehow they wouldn't let him off there, even though, uh, like me, he's from central Pennsylvania and knows how to navigate this weather. Um, not a Duke graduate. <laughs> but that's, that's, uh, there you go. Um, and we're going to be talking about the future of multilateralism. Uh, Homie got us started a little bit with his keynote on that. He talked both about individual performance as well as systemic performance, and I think we're going to touch on that uh, today in these comments. Uh, but I think we're also going to talk a lot about the politics of what it would take uh, for the multilateral system to deliver better uh, as we go forward. Um, each of the, the scholars who will be talking today has done a blog that will be posted that you'll be able to, um, to see if you miss uh, some of the nuance of, of that. But we are going to strictly enforce the eight minutes so we can get into a good conversation. Um, having said that, uh, Scott, I don't know if you can see us, but we can see you. And so we would love for you uh, to start us off with some comments. Um, at the end of eight minutes, hopefully you will hear a corn horn go off. But uh, if not, I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> Um, so Great. thanks very much. Uh, so you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Great. So thank you, Tony. Um, my apologies for not making it there. I did try. Um, and particularly my apologies to the audience for being subject to my very large head on the screen. Um, <laughs> uh, that's unfortunate. But um, glad to participate. I, um, I, I think it's, you know, it's a fantastic set of issues you all are discussing. and. Um, I, I've seen those blogs that, that Tony mentioned. I really am impressed um, by the issues put forward. So um, for my brief remarks, what I wanted to do, uh, rather than focus on multilateral institutions, which frankly is more of what I typically uh, write about, think about, um, I, I want to frame my remarks around multilateral norms and standards, um, and particularly um, something that's been capturing my attention in, in uh, let's call it the Trump era, um, is the degree to which um, I, I do worry, I think we should all worry that uh, we may be entering a, a, a new era of aid, frankly, that not, not all of which is driven by um, the current U.S. administration, but certainly is a key driver. And um, what I've tried to frame is sort of thinking about what it means to see a shift from development cooperation, um, which is really a way to talk about multilateralism, frankly, um, uh, to development competition. Um, and why I, I see that both as um, increasingly likely, um, and then what are the consequences of that and why we should worry about it. So let me just very briefly um, make what I see as sort of the key points in, in this argument. Um, so one, I think we should recognize that we have been in this, this era that it's been a, a very good one uh, defined by cooperation. Um, I think of, frankly, the work with, with Tony as your moderator that he, he did uh, in our time together in, in government, um, you know, defined around um, sitting down with, with um, other leading donor countries, but also uh, critically um, the beneficiaries of, of aid um, and coming to some agreements around um, aid standards um, and covering a wide range of issues, certainly um, addressing what had been previous bads, things like um, sort of a dominant use of tied aid and, and uh, trying to untie aid 
introducing greater levels of transparency to aid practices, um, the critical questions when it comes to uh, lending and even concessional lending, questions around debt sustainability. There's really been very good work done over a number of decades now uh, aimed at trying to have sort of a multilateral set of standards that, that act as disciplines um, for donor countries. Um, there have been countries uh, that we would call emerging donors and emerging actors that have been outside of those disciplines, and I think what we saw as sort of the next agenda was bringing them in in some way, and you know that in itself is no easy task. Um, and I think China uh, is sort of the emblematic actor um, when it came to thinking about um, sort of the the next set of challenges. How how do we um, uh, come to some agreement, particularly with China, uh, as a leading actor today, um, and even more so in the future, around these set of questions um, in, in ways that meet their needs, that uh, sort of effectively address what they may charge as a Western bias and some of these standards. Um, but that was sort of, I think, defined as, as um, uh, the, the future agenda. Um, what has gotten in the way of that, though, um, is, I would say, particularly the approach of, of the current administration in Washington, where um, increasingly the whole uh, enterprise of, of foreign aid, um, the approach to it, um, is not defined around um, what we have defined aid and aid objectives, sort of good development practice, development outcomes, what is the impact on the countries in which uh, donors are operating. Um, you don't hear a lot of that. It is defined in, frankly, a more what we would even call a weaponized way of how do we counter China as, as an aid actor, as a development actor in the world. Um, and it's very much, um, increasingly, it appears to be a guiding principle of this administration is um, when they look at their aid toolkit, um, uh, how is it operating effectively as a counter to China? Um, and very much defined around this idea that we, we are in, uh, certainly in conflict with China in a geostrategic sense, um, and using aid explicitly in that context. Uh, and we are in competition with China um, in an economic and commercial sense. And in the same respect, thinking about aid as an instrument in that kind of competition. Um, so I think everything that we see and hear coming out of this administration um, is defined in that way. Um, and you know, beyond rhetoric, I think um, we are seeing sort of concrete actions, again, that um, from where I sit are tend to be more a cause of concern than, than optimism, although I don't think it's wholly negative. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about positive um, but the concerns um, are things like um, what we hear from USAID defined as a clear choice agenda for developing countries, where um, our approach to engagement with them is uh, essentially um, in, in, on the more benign end of the scale to try to jockey for position vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese with them um, to make us um, uh, us, the U.S., um, uh, appear to be the, the favorable alternative to China, but alternative being the key word, that there is not room uh, to contemplate for developing countries having both the U.S. and China as important development partners, uh, that it is a choice. And then um, on, on the extreme other end of that scale, that um, it is an enforced choice, that essentially the message to developing countries is you have to choose. It's either the U.S. or China. Um, that um, setting things up in that way um, matters a lot when we're talking about the countries that we're talking about, namely U.S. and China. These are not sort of um, minor actors in the development landscape. They are, in fact, the leading actors. Uh, that's one uh, minute. One minute left. One minute. Okay. So, um, so that is really the the basis for concern. Um, as I said, not all negative. I think um, there's a way to think about competition that can be a positive competition. Namely, um, if we, the U.S., are worried about a lot 
of Chinese development finance, um, we can enter that space by offering our own development finance. And in fact, that's exactly what we're seeing with the passage of the Build Act by the Congress recently, uh, with the support of this administration that is aimed at creating a larger OPIC, a next generation of OPIC. I think that's all for the good, um, but the details will matter. Um, and the degree to which it's providing more um, development finance overall, that's the positive part. But how it, how it is done, um, again, is, is something to watch closely. The degree to which competitive concerns drives standards down, standards around um, environmental and social safeguards, uh, even question of debt, debt sustainability. Um, while the legislation um, sets important markers in that regard, I think uh, it is worth watching closely um, as this goes forward. So I should stop there. It sounds like I'm out of time. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. That's great. That's great to get us started. Um, so from development cooperation to development co competition with both advantages and disadvantages. So next we'll turn to Hannah Johnson from here at Duke. Thank you. So this panel was asked to consider what the future of multilateral development institutions is going to look like. And that's a difficult question. And so anytime you ask an academic to predict the future, of course, what we like to do is look at the past. So I'd, take, I'd like to take a macro view and think about what kind of key developments have happened in the last couple of decades that could give us some clues about where we're headed with multilateral uh, development institutions. So we know that the world has changed a lot since 1944, when the World Bank and its sister institution, the International Monetary Fund, were created in the wake of World War II. And some of those things are very easy to see. We've seen a lot of countries become independent as colonization has fallen apart, as the Soviet Union has dissolved and the Eastern Bloc has broken up. Those kinds of changes are obvious. And then there are less obvious changes as well, I think, such as the fact that inside development institutions, we often see that economics is not necessarily the only consideration play at play when we are giving aid, but in fact that aid has in many ways been tied to a lot of extra economic considerations as well, such as environmental safeguards or gender equality or good governance and so forth. So this has changed in a lot of ways since the 1940s, and we could discuss a lot of other ways as well. What I'm trying to pinpoint here is, is three big changes that I think that all multilateral development institutions, and not just the World Bank, need to keep in mind. And those three changes are, first of all, the proliferation of institutions, and secondly, the demand for these institutions to perform, and thirdly, the need for those institutions to seek out partnerships rather than trying to go it alone. So let me unpack each of those three big changes. The first is institutional proliferation. And so we know that the number of development institutions has grown. And part of the reason, I think, is because development is not a strictly economic topic. But it touches on everything from health to equality to education and so forth. And when there's that many policy issues at play, you tend to have different types of institutions that are attacking this big problem in different ways. And developing, de developing countries alike, I think, have been on a search since the 1940s for finding institutions that will do development the way that they see fit. And when those ex institutions don't already exist, what we do is we create new ones. Now, a lot of my research has shown how difficult it is to actually subtract institutions from the world, and so what we do is we add them. If we don't like what's going on, we craft a new one. When we don't like what that one is doing, then we craft a new one and so forth. And so we now have a very crowded field. If you think about development institutions just in terms of one type of institution, development banks, you can see how crowded this field is, even for that specific type. So you have the World Bank, but very soon after the creation of the World Bank, you have the creation of these regional development banks, something that had been discussed even before the World Bank itself was created. And so you're seeing these regional development banks. Now many of them play pretty nicely with the World Bank and see themselves as complements. They even follow some of the same standards that the World Bank does. But especially in the last couple of decades, we've seen development banks that don't necessarily fit neatly into the World Bank family. And so we see things like the Islamic Development Bank, a bank that is nominally focused on a religious affinity. We see things like the new creation of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is built around the idea of a specific type of development project that you want to focus on, and so forth. And so we've seen this proliferation, and we've also seen it go in many different directions in order to meet different constituencies and their needs. 
And so I think one of the common thread here is that there is an attraction, and a so far unabated attraction, to sort of bespoke institutions. In other words, if you don't find something that exactly meets your needs, let's think about creating something that might do it better. And we just continue and continue to do this. Without subtracting, we just keep adding. Now related to that, I think, this crowded field, this proliferation of institutions, is the second major change that I want to emphasize. And that's the demand for performance. So I gave examples of development banks and the proliferation that you see there. But at the same time that you've seen a proliferation of development banks, you've seen a proliferation of a lot of other development institutions as well. Of course, we have the UN Development Program, which is formalized in the 1960s within the United Nations system. We also have a lot of private banks that are getting into the field of, of lending to developing countries. And so developing countries, especially if they're middle income, no longer are forced to go through development banks themselves. And we often have a lot of uh, nonprofit and non-governmental actors. Think of the Gates Foundation and the ways that just in the last several years, it has really changed that landscape for um, development aid, especially in particular policy areas when you get a donor that's willing to really focus their resources on something that they want to change specifically. And so this crowded field, as well as the reality that as you get the private sector and as you get these big foundations in that field and they're demanding certain measures of performance, you're going to get these intergovernmental institutions also expected to show their performance. Now the difficulty with performance is it's easy to demand and it's really difficult to show. And there's a lot of debate in the literature about whether it's okay to show your performance simply by your activities or whether you actually need to show the output of those activities, whether we care about long-term impacts, how we would actually trace how long-term impacts are directly caused by some specific actor, especially these development institutions, that we expect to show some kind of causal link between what they're doing and the kind of success that we expect to see. So there's a lot of demand for performance. There are different ways of trying to get at performance. We have a lot of excitement about things like randomized control treatments that are supposed to isolate, isolate an intervention and be able to pinpoint what the causal impact is. But in fact, those are very difficult to apply to entire institutions rather than just to narrow interventions. And so there's a lot of difficulty because we see these institutions ask to perform very well and to demonstrate their good performance, but we don't have a lot of great ideas about how they're supposed to do that. The third factor that I want to emphasize is related to both of the other two. Both the, pro the proliferation of institutions as well as the demand for performance means that no institution can really go it alone these days. They have to seek out partners. And those partners are not necessarily going to be same type partners. And so you may see a lot of um, relationships between the public and the private sector. You may see nonprofit organizations, foundations, and so forth. And the reality is that as you scan that landscape, if you're a development institution, you need to be strategic about what kinds of institutions to partner with. And in other research that I've done, I have argued that the way that you look for cooperative partners is you try to find other actors that share your values but don't share your resource pools. Because if you're pulling from the same resource pools, you end up actually in competition or co-optation rather than bringing new um, and above and beyond resources to the problem. So it's not that simple in this crowded field, even though you might think there's a lot of potential partners uh, to choose from to actually find ones that fit that criteria of shared values but unshared resources. But I think that these three features, proliferation, performance, and partnership, are important individually. And as I've also talked about, they're important in conjunction with one another. They're really shaping the landscape in which development banks, as well as development institutions more generally, are operating now and into the future. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I also think it's interesting, so Scott taking the, the view of norms and standards, um, but you're taking the macro view, actually the two aren't, aren't, uh, can actually be integrated together. You can think of those three uh, dimensions that you talked about, both in terms of cooperation, but also competition. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Great, thanks Tony, and uh, thanks to Scott and Tana for getting us off to um, such a nice start. Uh, I'm going to talk about the role of international institutions in providing global public goods, which is something that has been on the agenda um, a lot in, the, in both internal and external discussions at, um, at, global, um, at global institutions. What I want to talk about is what they should look like if they're going to be effective providers of global public goods. And to preview my answer to this, 
Um, and the short answer is that they should look more like Gabby and less like the World Bank. So how do I get there? So I start with the question of why are global public goods so hard for countries to provide? So by this, I mean global public goods are goods that countries would be better off if these things were provided, and yet we don't get them provided in a non-cooperative setting because each state kind of hopes that the other states will provide that good and others get to benefit uh, by free riding off of the provision of others. Right? So no state wants to be the one that's bearing most of the cost. They'd rather sit back and let others do it. In international relations theory, as well as economic theory, we say, well, international institutions are a solution to this problem. It can allow states to come together to pool their resources, to avoid free riding, to lock in cooperation by other partners, so that I don't feel badly about handing over my money because I know that this institution will ensure that other countries hand over their money too. All right, so we lock in this cooperation and we're able to get to a better outcome, which is that the global public good is actually provided. Okay? And some of the key global public goods that are talked about here are things like climate change mitigation or um, responses to or ways to prevent the spread of pandemic diseases. I also have in mind things like famines, where many countries would prefer that famines don't occur inside other countries, but don't want to step up and, and pony up the cost for that. They'd rather have it be a, a joint response. And sometimes these things then fall through the cracks and don't get provided. So in order for an institution to work in this setting, it has to be the case that if me as country A is going to hand over my money to you, I'm going to do it because I believe that countries B, C, D, and E are also going to hand over money to you. I believe that you as the institution are providing some credible commitment mechanism that says we're all in this together. And if that credible commitment mechanism fails, if I don't think that you as an institution can ensure that if I give my money in, that other countries will give their money in, and not only will they give their money in, but it will actually go for the cause we said it would, which is the provision of that global public good, then this commitment mechanism breaks down, and the institution is not able to serve as a credible provider or a leader in providing these global public goods. So that brings me to the World Bank. The World Bank does not have a governance structure that would lead it to be able to facilitate the provision of global public goods. It doesn't have that kind of commitment and hand tying mechanism that we need to get countries to believe that other countries are putting money in to deal with problems like climate change or pandemic disease. Why is that? Well, the governance structure of the World Bank is very state-centric and it's very unequally state-centric so that powerful actors are able to influence the allocation of funds and um, the, the um, programs that the World Bank undertakes. And when that happens, they're unable to tie their hands. They're unable to say, well, we're only going to influence these type of projects, but we won't influence those projects in climate change. Right? The hand tying mechanism is gone. And they're unable to say that we will, if you put your money in for climate change, we guarantee that we will not say that that money should go get used for country X that has a seat on the permanent, you know, a, a seat on the a rotating seat on the Security Council. They can't tie their hands and do that, and so the commitment mechanism breaks down. It's interesting, as with the World Bank as kind of a backdrop, this kind of state-centric, relatively old institution um, in, the, in the realm of development institutions, to compare it to two newer institutions. One is the Green Climate Fund, and the other that I want to talk about is Gabby. The Green Climate Fund um, was created in 2010, um, came online a few years later. It has a state-centric governing structure, so the board is made up of um, 24 country members. Um, all of them are states. It is split between developed and developing countries, so there's equal representation on the board between recipients and donors. Um, it is tasked with providing solutions to, um, in the realms of global uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, and it is spectacularly unsuccessful. Um, what is shocking to me about this organization is that they managed to learn none of the lessons that we learned from existing institutions when they put this institution together. And so what you have with the Green Climate Fund is very little funding coming in. Currently, no, pro no new projects being um, uh, approved that are in complete gridlock and very little having been done in the meantime. Um, 
And so you have, you know, so you had, they thought they solved one of the problems, which was you needed developing country representation on the boards of these institutions for them to be effective. But even with that, they didn't, they weren't able to be effective. And my argument with that is because they're still a state-centric institution. They're still on the states who hold power at the Green Climate Fund, they might be developing and developed, but the individual states still cannot commit to tie their hands and not skew funds away from their most efficient use for um, prov providing for climate change mitigation and adaptation, which reduces buy-in from other actors and allows the funding to dry up. Contrast that to Gabby, the Vaccine Alliance, which created in 2000, um, and it's a combination of intergovernmental, state, and private actors that created Gabby. Its board consists of 27 voting members. Only 10 of them are states, and no states have permanent representation on Gabby, on Gabby's board. Uh, it receives a significant amount of private sector funding, as well as funding from the same funders who fund places like the World Bank and the Green Climate Fund. Gabby has been, by most accounts, very successful. They have um, managed to vaccinate um, over a half of uh, over half a billion children. Um, leading to you know reduction of loss of life in the mil is in the millions. I would argue that the reason that they're able to do this, where the World Bank and the, and the Green Climate Fund have failed, is because there's a significant amount of delegation of authority to Gabby in the board structure that is absent in these state-centric organizations, and that allows Gabby to stay focused on its mission to ensure funders, including private funders, that the mission of Gabby will be what it says the mission of Gabby will be. They've been able to insulate their board from these external pressures in a way that the state-centric institutions have not. And so I would argue then that going forward, when we want to focus on global public goods, we want to put them inside an organization that is more narrowly focused than the World Bank, right? One of the reasons that the World Bank is unlikely to reform to be able to have the type of governance structure that it would need to be effective at providing global public goods is because it states, powerful states, have a vested interest in the way that it looks now. And they have that because it's a very broad institution with a lot of influence, and these states want to keep their influence within the World Bank. If we have institutions that are more narrowly focused on individual um, uh, public goods and have a board structure that takes power away from states, they're more likely to be able to fulfill that commitment mechanism that states want them to fulfill in providing global public goods they're more likely to get buy-in from private actors, and so you have additional funding coming into the system to address these problems. <laughs> and they're more like, and they're more likely to actually make progress in um, in achieving the goals that we set for tackling the problems associated with global public goods. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. That that noise coming in right there was not uh, was not indicative of a, either a, pot, a thumbs up or a thumbs down <laughs> on your thesis. Um, but interestingly, what what I take from that, especially um, following up on, on Hannah's presentation, is uh, some rationale, especially where global public goods are concerned, for proliferation. Actually, um, so Christopher. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to be lazy and stay seated. <laughs> Drop the mic. Um, so I'd like to uh, talk today sort of looking at what's the likely short-term and medium-term uh, uh, future of the World Bank, but I think a fair amount of it could be generalized to other uh, multilateral development banks as well. Um, as I think has been mentioned several times today, and everyone is clearly aware of, the Trump administration has seemed either disinterested in or, or hostile to multilateralism. Um, and that's in spite of the fact that we're, that, that multilateral system is one that is largely designed by and dominated by the U.S., right? So it really, in some sense, makes little sense. Um, we, we've seen uh, attacks on the liberal trade regime, that's clear every day. Um, what might not have uh, uh, attracted as much attention is the disinterest the Trump administration has shown to the multilateral development banks and the other the, the IFIs, the international financial institutions in general. That disinterest is evident in the fact that the uh, U.S. executive director seat at the World Bank is vacant. Nobody has been appointed. The U.S. executive director seat at the Inter-America Development Bank is vacant. No one has been appointed. The U.S. executive director seat at the Asian Development Bank is vacant. No one has been appointed. Uh, at the African Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the IMF, 
the rules are different, so that can't happen, but instead we left our alternate executive director seat vacant. So a clear sim uh, a signal in all these cases that Trump just doesn't care. All right? So that's the sort of background saying that the, the US administration has been uninterested in these international financial institutions. Um, I have uh, uh, some recent research with a colleague at Villanova that suggests that this is likely to change uh, because of the midterm elections. So historically, when the US government is all of the same party, the Congress and the president of the same party, the president has better control over bilateral aid as a possible tool for foreign policy goals. But when we see a divided government, when at least one chamber in Congress is of a different party, then the president, the administration, has less control over what happens with bilateral aid, and therefore historically has exerted more influence over the World Bank, has twisted the World Bank's arm to achieve US foreign policy objectives. So we're now seeing uh, Trump, uh, the Trump administration in that setting where they no longer uh, control both chambers of Congress. Um, now, of course, Trump doesn't follow typical patterns. That's the one thing that's been predictable about him. Um, and he seems to have shown interest in using aid as a stick. So for example, threatening to cut aid to Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador in response to the, the uh, migrant caravan. Um, so we might expect, though, that it, 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 he won't, uh, he, he might not change over to trying to use uh, the World Bank as an in incentive, but instead view it now as his alternative stick. Uh, that is to say that he may be interested in applying negative US pressure to the World Bank now that the Congress is uncooperative. In other words, getting the World Bank to cut loans to countries that are not favored by the US at any given point in time. Of course, things can change, right? So the um, Reagan administration was very uninterested in the multilateral development banks during its first term, and then in the second term suddenly discovered that they would be a brilliant solution to the debt crisis and became very interested in them. And we saw uh, some positive, I would say, some positive developments out of that. So that could happen. There could be some crisis where suddenly the administration does a U-turn. Um, but it seems more likely that the US would exert negative pressure on the bank. So we need, a th and, and the, the World Bank would resist because it's more likely to respond to somebody saying, hey, lend more because that's its business model, and less likely to respond to someone saying, hey, lend less. But the Trump administration, I think, has established itself as having a pretty strong position and is likely then to win arguments in the sense that they, their threats are very credible on the negative side. Um, so I want to think through then the long-term uh, implications of this for the World Bank and more broadly speaking for uh, multilateral development banks. Um, if we look at U.S. leadership in this setting, there's clearly been lots of criticism. But we can also point to play, uh, instances where the U.S. has been a force for good for positive changes in the World Bank and elsewhere. So for example, project evaluation at the World Bank. It is really in many ways the leader in doing project evaluation. Every World Bank project is evaluated. That happened because of pressure from the United States in the 1970s. The inspection panel. The World Bank was the first to put in an inspection panel. That happened because of US pressure in the 1990s. Uh, disclosure of information. Anybody who's done research on these banks, the World Bank is by far the best of them, and that is, again, due to US pressure on the World Bank to disclose information in the, year, in the, in the last decade. Um, so we do see some elements of US leadership. We can't say it's never been a good leader, I think. Um, but we also know that the US has a de facto veto over structural changes, uh, ma major changes uh, in, at the World Bank. And so it would need to, if it stops providing leadership, it would need to allow some other country to take over that leadership role. And given historical patterns, that seems very unlikely. So as the US ceases to provide leadership at the World Bank and presses to uh, cut funding, it's more likely just to allow the institution to drift. And this suggests more trust funds with uh, special purposes, a uh, harder time uh, uh, pushing forward IDA replenishments and increases in World Bank capital. In addition to this, the, the negative attitude that the administration has had toward the bank um, is likely 
uh, to accelerate the trend of credit rating agencies uh, looking not at the callable capital of the World Bank, but just at the paid-in capital. Not believing that those commitments to callable capital are really valid, but instead just saying, what money does the World Bank have on hand? That's likely to further restrict what it can do, make it even more reliant on trust funds and other special purpose funds, and make it have to narrow its focus on what it tries to accomplish. Um, we can certainly say that in the long run, and this has been commented on a couple times already, in the long run, it's the rise of China that's the really big issue. Um, but in the short to medium run, it seems like it's the disinterest of the Trump administration that's the pressing issue. And the key question is how this will be interpreted by other partners. Is this going to be interpreted as a one-off thing and after Trump, the US will resume its leadership role? Or will this be taken as a signal that the US is in general an unreliable leader? Thank you. Thanks, I think, uh, so, so one thing that I hope we get to talk a little bit about, um, as you said, things can change quickly, and I'm wondering if the Trump administration wakes up, and with Scott's thesis, and as you were just saying, competition with China, um, perhaps the World Bank then becomes a tool in that competition and sort of suddenly reawakens to, to what the value might be there. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I think we're, we're broadly in agreement. There are a lot of nuances we could talk about uh, if we get a chance to unpack them all. Um, so I, I want to put, frame this in terms of the question of the sustainability of the development finance infrastructure. Uh, I think, uh, as I questioned to Homi, might have uh, indicated, I think this the, the uh, talk that he gave could have been given two years ago um, without any changes. Uh, but the world has changed dramatically in the meantime. Now the question is whether uh, it, it even makes sense to ask the same technocratic questions about how ought we to ideally organize uh, development finance. The question is, can we keep it alive and in what form and, and so forth. Uh, so I, I think that it is a signal achievement of US diplomacy that uh, every major uh, economy in the world contributes to a, an array of uh, development finance institutions. And these development finance institutions, uh, you know, they, they provide, as Tana points, out, Tana points out, they provide a, you know, a, a panoply of alphabet soup, and they're hard to get rid of, and we're not always sure whether there's some duplication involved. But they allow for pooling of resources, uh, that, go, that is remarkably broad uh, around providing public goods. Uh, they allow for focusing on particular priorities. They allow coordination uh, between donors and recipients and among donors uh, about best practices and about uh, conditions for, for using funds and so forth. And they allow for the development of specialized expertise and for a longer term uh, project cycle and evaluation cycle than would ever be possible on a bilateral basis. So they provide tremendous value to the international community. Uh, and, and the fact that we've managed to get everyone on board is extraordinary. Um, that's not something that is normal in world history, that we have broad participation in long-term objectives uh, that are generally valuable, uh, that have almost universal buy-in. Uh, but, these are political institutions, right? So they're sustained by political equilibria. And they have to be valuable to all the members. Right? And they have to overcome the temporal inconsistencies of all the members. Right? So they have to be worthwhile for, for weak states to participate in. And they're, weak, they're worthwhile because they provide sufficient guarantees that those weak states won't be exploited. And they have to be. Uh, uh, worthwhile for powerful states to participate in. And it's hard for powerful states to commit to rules, right? Because they have really attractive outside options. And when uh, the chips are down and the stakes are high, uh, they're going to use those outside options, right? So you have to design these institutions pragmatically so that there are escape valves. And as a practical matter, they've been designed in such a way that the United States can control them when it really wants to, right? Through informal influence. A lot of my research has been about that, how, how precisely that works. How does the United States control the IMF with 17%, less than 17% now of the votes? Right? And it does, when it needs to. Um, 
uh, Von Christopher's work has shown that the same thing is true for, for the World Bank. Uh, and we, we know things like uh, these institutions' uh, allocations respond to how countries vote in the UN General Assembly. They respond to whether countries have temporary membership on the UN Security Council and how they vote when they do. Uh, they respond to you know, a, a wide range of U.S. strategic uh, objectives and so on and so forth. Now, this limits the sort of optimistic message that I was giving you at the, at the, at the beginning. Right? They're extraordinarily valuable uh, for general purposes. They're also particularly valuable for the United States when we want to accomplish specific things because the IMF can mobilize a lot more money a lot faster right, than you can get through Congress. When there's, a, when there's a crisis. This is a uniquely powerful foreign policy tool. Uh, and that means that uh, the credibility of the IMF, the World Bank, all these other institutions, uh, is always compromised. Right? And it's most compromised in the most important countries, the ones where you, you most want to be able to reassure capital markets. Right? Those are the ones where you can't do it. So uh, Russia, Argentina, these are the countries we could never say because they're too important. Right? Uh, this is very, very predictable. Um, and I want to take, uh, maybe a little unfair, I want to pick on one thing that Sarah said, because I think a lot of the ideal solutions right, to these problems, uh, you know, we can point out the, 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 the failures of the existing institutions, but a lot of the ideal solutions are just out of equilibrium. Right? We, 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 can't get contra we, we can't build Gavi into a huge uh, uh, program because it's, it doesn't satisfy the incentive compatibility constraints of the, uh, the powerful countries. Um, so then what does this mean when you have a dramatic change in the distribution of power? Right? When a China appears on the, on the scene, or when a Japan appeared on the scene in the early 1980s, it was the same kind of problem. Um, the, the, what I take to be the Obama strategy was you try to include them, you try to reassure them that uh, the, the, the world set of multilateral institutions is friendly to China's uh, long-range ambitions and that playing within the rules and not being disruptive will be more beneficial to China uh, than the alternatives that they might uh, consider. And that strategy was always going to be difficult. It was going to be difficult to, uh, to credibly convey that. Right? Uh, but we successfully did that with Japan. Right? Now, the security uh, dimensions of that were different. Um, but that was, a, that was a, um, a strategy that I think we were pursuing pretty successfully. And there were more or less symbolic changes in governance structure of the IMF and the World Bank that were pretty satisfactory to China. And where uh, China really wasn't satisfied because we'd made a bilateral deal with Japan to give Japan control of the Asian Development Bank, right? And you couldn't really undo that because our deal with Japan in the, in, in the World Bank and the IMF depended upon the deal in the Asian Development Bank, right? So the, the, the outlet for that was, well, China can go ahead and build its own uh, version of the Asian Development Bank, the, uh, the AIIB, and also the, you know, the New Development Bank uh, through the BRICS. And we're not going to protest that too much or frustrate it too much. Um, besides, those are tiny institutions, right? Compared to uh, $67 billion worth of uh, World Bank loans and $20 billion worth of Asian Development uh, Bank loans, all right, the AIB has about a billion dollars of loans outstanding. The NDB has about 226 million outstanding. And that was okay. Um, but then you get Trump, right? And populists somehow you know, stormed the Bastille and took over the um, central linchpin of the global uh, structure. And now it's not clear at all that we're going to get eye to replenishment right, next year. Uh, it's not clear at all that we can get a quota expansion next year in the IMF. Right? Those are both, and all the other. All, it seems like almost everybody is up for replenishment next year. Right? So it's all going to crash down at the same time. Um, now, you know that'll have more severe uh, consequences with Ida than it will in some of the other areas. Uh, but meanwhile, what we're doing with Ch in trade with China has got to be pushing China outside of the orbit of multilateral institutions generally. And I think that is potentially much more threatening in the long run uh, because uh, Trump has torpedoed the only strategy that makes sense going forward with China. Right. Thanks very much. And I think the, the, the only thing I would add even to what you were saying about the um, 
the governance, the internal governance, and trying to get everyone on board into that governance. It's also reflected in the agreements that have actually been happening multilaterally. So when you look at Paris and you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, those were voluntary agreements so that you could get everybody on board, but then that loses sort of enforcement mechanisms because there's no, there's no sort of force of treaty as well. And so you're starting to weaken the institutions and the agreements that we get. So we've had quite a tour, the Raison here, um, and we've left plenty of time for discussion and engagement. Um, I'd like to get a couple of questions from the audience. I know I have some questions as well um, that we can add to that, but uh, um, who, uh, who's interested in, in what this has provoked here? He's a former World Banker, though, so you should take uh, us. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we got your back, sir. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Maria. I'm a first year PhD student at Sanford. I'm curious to know what are the implications for recipient countries, the shifts in multilateralism? Thanks. A direct but not simple question. <laughs> Great. Another one? Hi, I'm Brian Pinto, uh, formerly of the World Bank. And really, two questions. Uh, first, to, to Randy. I didn't quite understand what you said about the US overusing its privilege, and in the case of Russia and Argentina, not being able to reassure the markets. If you could explain that, uh, I'd be grateful. Um, I happen to be, by the way, the economist in Moscow in 1998 for the World Bank, mm -hmm. when that package was, the bailout package was being negotiated. And I was not sure, uh, for Sarah, you know, why you prefer the Gavi model. Um, by the way, Ngozi Okonje Weala, who's the chair of Gavi, happened to be my boss at the world. And um, I worked more recently on Africa, and she was part of a high-level panel for which I had to write a report. And uh, I remember she once said that Gavi is able to persuade countries. You know, the, the pre-commitment of finance for Gavi is a big deal. That you know, the countries are able to guarantee. And she said, of course, that's because it's vaccines and helping children, and Gavi's ability to persuade donors that it's working itself out of a job. So how does that affect, you know, is, are the World Bank and the IMF sort of seen as permanent institutions? Uh, you know, is there something to do with the absence of learning on the part of the World Bank and the IMF? And you know, regarding Tanner's point about the proliferation of, of these agencies, um, is this diminishing the influence of the World Bank and the IMF? Is, you know, what sort of learning is there? You know, because I'm going to allude to some of these things tomorrow. Uh, on the macro side, and I see Scott Morris, we've had exchanges in the past on the IMF's debt sustainability framework and very different views on you know, whether it's a good framework or not. Uh, so, so I'd be, you know, what sort of learning is there? What sort of oversight is there ultimately? What sort of accountability is there? Thank you. Great. Do we have one more? Yeah. Ah, sorry. I'm Catherine Bennett, I'm also a first year PhD student, and I'm curious to hear from you, um, since the IMF acknowledged neoliberalism in 2016, what effects you've seen on, in multilateral institutions and which ones you anticipate? Okay, so let's... Uh, let's Try answering that one. Yeah, let's, uh, let's take on this, um, uh, let's take on this set of questions. So the first question was around the implications for recipients. Um, so do I have a taker on this particular question? I have a very brief thing that can start us off. Um, I think it's very interesting to think about the fact that on the one hand, recipient countries have more options. On the other hand, realistically, those options were not made by them. So the really tough part of development, and we see this in the African Development Bank as well, is that you may try to bring together a number of developing countries and try to amplify their voices by cooperating, but at the end of the day, they still tend to lack the money that they need, and then they need to go outside to get that money from donors. And when donors pony up that money, then they make demands. So even with this proliferation of institutions, I think many of them are set up to serve development needs, but ultimately they are very responsive to donors and they are still not going to be as responsive to the recipients, even though there are more options. Thanks, and Scott, um, I wonder if you want to comment on this, if whether you know, the potential looming development competition versus development cooperation, how does that change 
uh, what you know, how does that change the, the perspective of recipient countries? And, and Homie mentioned a little earlier in his keynote that um, you know, he didn't necessarily believe there was such a clear choice because the US, for example, doesn't do much in infrastructure and what a lot of China's financing is focused on is infrastructure, which is a lot of what recipient countries need. So it would just be great to get your perspective on, on this question about the perspective and what the implications are for recipient countries. Sure. Well, um, yeah, I agree with Homi. If you look at sort of the portfolio of what the two countries offer now, they are very different. Uh, but uh, that's sort of the point of this move toward um, a bigger OPEC, is, is trying to match uh, instruments with the Chinese. Um, I think the from a uh, recipient, let's call them borrowing countries, that's what we're talking about here, the borrowing country perspective, um, you know, one one concern is that um, this certainly, when it comes to the Chinese, and what I worry about for the U.S. is that this this type of assistance is as often about supporting U domestic firms as it is um, whatever you're trying to achieve in the developing country, um, and you know, so it you know it can lead to pushing deals onto countries that aren't frankly very good for them. Um, selling uh, airplanes uh, to countries that may not need, need airplanes. Um, the other thing I would say is that, that ties this to the MDBs actually is that it's also part of a much broader trend of essentially a hardening of terms, what it's called. It's a move um, away from grants generally uh, toward development finance and then even within development finance um, because of changes in the financial models of the institutions themselves uh, the need to introduce um, harder terms, uh, higher interest rates on loans. And you're really, it's striking um, how much we're seeing that. It's certainly the IDA reforms, but you're even seeing it in institutions that you wouldn't think, you know, that, that frankly are, you know, they're doing pretty straightforward social sector stuff, but they're also now talking about going to markets. And um, so, I, you know, I think that's, when we consider what the external landscape looks like right now with rising concerns about that sustainability, um, that that set of, um, sort of that trend overall um, is, is something to worry about. I would say, you know, I, I heard Brian Pinto's comments, we, we've talked about this, you know, there are different ways to look at that and you can, you know, if we look at the African Development Bank, maybe it's better for them to offer slightly harder terms if that can effectively uh, crowd out um, even more onerous borrowing terms from from other sources, and um, but you know the general trend is one that sort of this whole community of development finance is shifting more of a financing burden on countries when perhaps um, they're least prepared to to shoulder it. Christopher, did you want? Uh, yeah, so addressing that same question of implications for recipient countries, thinking about the World Bank. Um, so the, the divided U.S. government implies that the, uh, the World Bank will be used more often as an enforcement tool for countries that have done things that displease the U.S. administration so that they would see slower disbursement of funds, they would make, uh, find it harder to get new loans approved, uh, they would find uh, conditions on adjustment loans, on development policy lending enforced more strictly uh, all range of different activities. We would expect that the World Bank uh, would be pressured to uh, become more of a tool for U.S. foreign policy. Looking more broadly in terms of thinking about um, the U.S. Uh, supporting World Bank less and to the extent that it does um, uh, that it does interfere doing it in a negative way, um, that's likely to uh, again make the bond uh, rating agencies uh, less um, optimistic about what's going to happen at the World Bank, less certain that the donors are there as a backstop in case that a borrower cannot repay, and that is going to uh, hurt the credit rating. That raises the interest rate that the World Bank borrows at, and therefore it raises the interest rate that the recipient gov uh, governments would be paying on those loans. So all of those are things that I would see as implications. So why don't we go to Randy, because um, you had trust the question to you just to clarify what you, what you were talking about on the U.S. overusing privilege. Uh, yeah, 
Uh, thanks for the question. I don't know if you remember, but I remember talking to you in your Moscow office in 1998. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I was busy doing uh, research on my second book. I hope I was nice to you. <laughs> very nice. You're very helpful. Um, and you were kind enough to meet with me when the Russians didn't want to meet with me for some reason that summer. It was really hard to get a conversation with a Russian policymaker in the summer of 1998. That was just before the financial crisis, of course. Um, so. What I'm referring to is there's a substantial um, body of literature now, you know, that some of it I'm responsible for, and lots of other people have written it now too, that show uh, that uh, there's a lot of political skewing of IMF lending. Uh, a particular thing that I've uh, contributed to that is showing that uh, the credibility of the enforcement of conditionality is very contingent on political influence. So the, that 2002 book uh, showed that countries that got a lot of aid from the United States that were post-communist countries uh, would just get a slap on the wrist when they violated their conditions rather than uh, being forced to actually make major policy reforms. And so there's a, so the, the IMF maintains a differentiated reputation. It, it does in fact give the slap on the wrist but just a slap on the wrist to major borrowers. And then uh, more, you know, other countries are held to different standards and actually have to achieve the conditions uh, that they have failed to achieve in the past in order to get uh, uh, the next tranche of loans. Uh, then uh, in 2004, I had an APSR paper which uh, tested the same mechanism in Africa and found the same pattern. Uh, in 2011, I had another book uh, called Controlling Institutions, which used much better data and a global data set, found the same patterns, and also with respect to other kinds of measures of US interests, like uh, the uh, concentration of US bank lending in particular countries, uh, which is a particularly good predictor of what happened in Argentina. Right, that, uh, and and they, they also expanded to, 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 those, to the uh, East Asian crisis countries and uh, into Argentina. Um, more recently, I have a paper last year that came out that um, used uh, the, the spread on um, uh, short-term um, um, short bonds uh, that governments issue to um, uh, capture the credibility effects of IMF lending. And what we found there was uh, that countries that are influential, you know, that, are, that have, uh, are important to US foreign policy uh, pay much higher interest rates when they get a, an IMF loan. Right? And in fact, our, uh, our estimates, when we apply them to the Russian case, uh, predicted within a couple of percentage points how much Russian short-term bond rates spiked in the summer of 1998 after the IMF program was announced. Right? Uh, so there's this sense that, um, that uh, this political influence really eliminates the power of the IMF to reassure bond markets. So, um, so thank you. Uh, Sarah, I'll go to you because he raised the question uh, about your, your thinking through of Gavi. And as Kano was suggesting, proliferation is sort of a fact of life. And, and you're actually providing a rationale for, for that um, proliferation on global public goods. But also then raises the question of accountability and of what it does to shift the system, actually, the multilateral system, does it diminish the influence of more established institutions? So, um, so if you can comment on that. Sure. You might. Well, um, thank you, Brian, for your question. And I think it actually um, goes nicely with the, um, with the comment that, that Randy raised about what I had said as well. Um, and part of it, I think, is, is time constraint when, it gets, when you have eight minutes to give an argument. I don't want to, um, I, I don't think that, that I don't want to move, I don't argue that moving away from a World Bank type system or, or structure is good for everything. What I'm arguing is that for the specific areas of global public goods, we want to separate them out from institutions that have broader mandates. Because institutions that have broader mandates are going to be subject to the capture by um, the powerful states that are not going to be willing to relinquish power. So Randy, to your question on you know, things on the equilibrium path, I think my argument would be the equilibrium path is to have both. Right? The equilibrium path is to have a World Bank that provides the type of goods that the World Bank is really good at providing. Right? So um, things that, we, that um, scholars have written about in terms of what are some benefits that come from World Bank as opposed to from bilateral um, engagement alone. Things like legitimacy, right? risk sharing, um, economies of scale, providing expertise. Things that the World Bank does quite well and can continue to do quite well even in a model where it sometimes gets co-opted by the special interests of 
um, powerful countries within it. That model does not work for providing global public goods, which is why the World Bank has not been very good at leading the charge in providing global public goods. I don't think we want to have a huge Gabby. I think we want to have several little Gabbies, each focused on their own issue, and hopefully they do outlive their useful, or they don't outlive their usefulness, they die because their usefulness goes away. Hopefully we solve the problem of climate change and we don't need climate change institutions. We solve the problem of vaccines and we don't need vaccine institutions. They kind of have their own death sentence written into them in that sense if they're focused on these more narrow issues, which could, to go to um, some of Tana's work, suggest that you know there's proliferation in the short term, but not uh, maybe these type of institutions die off more readily once they're no longer a use for them. Um, than, um, than other institutions. And I, I think what's also, one of the other th reasons that this could be, um, that these institutions like Gavi can really add to this equilibrium path, be something that's seen as good by states, is that a lot of funding from these institutions, for these institutions like Gavi or the Global Fund is coming from private actors. If we go back to Homie's talk earlier today, there's this need to crowd in private financing, right? We're not going to be able to do all of this just with funding provided by states, but private financers, if you think of tapping into corporations concerned about corporate, um, you know, global corporate responsibility and wanting to give money back, they're not going to want to give it to institutions that are going to be captured by states. They're going to want to give it to institutions where they're going to be able to point to it and say, look at our money vaccinated all these kids, our money provided education, our money, um, you know, dealt with um, HIV AIDS or with climate change, right? And so that this is what they're, this is what they're going to want to do. And the way to crowd in these, to crowd in these private donors is to have institutions that they feel more confident are going to actually be providing those type of goods. I want to pick up there then and talk about the learning piece of your question. And so there's a very nice literature within political science that has um, two insights that would be relevant <coughs> to that. One would be the literature on norm cascades and another the literature on reputation and shaming. And the upside of um, the proliferation of these institutions is that you create these larger peer groups. And when you have those larger <coughs> peer groups, you can get best practices. You can worry about the state of your reputation versus that of others. People like Judith Kelly, our colleague at the Sanford School, has looked at that among states and how you can shame states into living up to a reputation by saying, Argentina, you should be doing as well as Brazil. And that's very powerful if states see themselves as peers. In I think soccer or something else? In <laughs> soccer especially, but other, <laughs> other areas too. <laughs> Um, but norm cascades as well, and, and there's work by people like Dan Nielsen who look at that within the multilateral development banks and the ways that um, the kind of environmental and, and other standards that have been put into place in the World Bank has then filtered down into other multilateral development banks. Even with new development banks like the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, you see that kind of learning going on where there are a lot of personnel who have experience within the World Bank or ex pre-existing multilateral development banks. And increasingly, you, you have a country like China saying, we want to make this new bank more transparent. We want to be more forthright about the kinds of projects we're doing and the, the standards that are behind them. So I do think that there's that kind of learning going on. I think the downside is with the prolifer proliferation of these institutions, what are the peer groups? You do have this sense of peer groups and you may be trying to live up to a reputation among those peer groups, but now when you have public-private partnerships and all these different things, do multilateral development banks actually look at those public-private partnerships like Gavi and look to them as being role models or sources for best practices, or do they see that as an other that doesn't really pertain to them? And I think often they don't, they don't see them as a role model for themselves. So I'll just take moderator's privilege. I know we have to show results that donors are also feeling. So they get to be able to, to invest in a different way and be able to say, yes, we're doing well on HIV AIDS, for example, through the targeted work that the Global Fund is doing. But I think the question also is if proliferation is a fact of life and if partnerships are a fact of life, um, and as Homi mentioned, even uh, earlier today, the, the eminent persons panel for the G20, when they looked at the MDB system, said, we need to be thinking about this more systemically. What are the systemic solutions? And this is really where um, the multilateral system ought to be evolving to. Doesn't this then just presage more fragmentation, and does it make it more difficult to ensure that we're covering the entire ground that needs to be covered? Um, how do we know whether there's gaps or whether there's redundancies or frankly whether there's really tough issues to be taken on that nobody really wants to come to play on and so that goes undone. 
Um, I mean, the, the place of the World Bank, you can at least put the issue on the table, but uh, you might have difficulty sort of creating a critical mass around much more difficult, um, uh, much more difficult issues. So open, open question to anyone who, who might want to comment on that fragmentation and, and the, the sort of the tension with the systemic uh, solutions that we need to be thinking about. Just a, a really a brief kind of broad comment on fragmentation. It fragmentation is not necessarily always bad, mm -hmm. right? So we, we have as a so when it comes from the point of view of recipient countries, you often think of fragmentation as a bad thing because it's a lot of a lot more people to respond to, a lot of extra paperwork, a lot of extra reports to file. Um, but uh, and other times we think of it as a good thing. If one donor dries up, the other donors are still there, right? And so you have that type of fragmentation. When it comes to fragmentation in institutions. I feel like there's an entire literature on how um, the evils of large, big bureaucracies it gets left out when we talk about fragmentation. And it's not clear that, you know, while there are benefits of bringing things together under one roof, there are certainly costs to big bureaucratic institutions um, that should be part of the conversation when we're talking about the kind of optimal size of organizations to operate in, um, to operate in, in in different areas and kind of the optimal scope of organizations across how many areas they should be operating before they, these institutions just become too big and too unwieldy. Great. Anyone else? Just one, one brief comment is we, we should never expect institutions to be optimal. <laughs> uh, on the, the issue of fragmentation, I think it, it's actually even more complex because we can see fragmentation within institutions. So. You can look at the World Bank doing a million different things, uh, having several thousand individual trust funds, and usually volunteering for whatever is the next thing that needs to be done. Yep. Um, so we had a question on the IMF and its embrace of neoliberalism and what the effects of that have been. Who wants to tackle it? <laughs> 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 the short answer is that if you have a, uh, case if you have a French head, you sooner or later you're going to start doing things like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I, I wasn't quite sure what you were uh, asking about there, but I, I do think that we've seen an interesting uh, reorientation at the IMF, which you know, I give a certain amount of credit to uh, for Lagarde's uh, uh, stance on Greece to the Obama administration, just because of the way the IMF works. Uh, it's, it's, it's not credible to me that uh, she could have uh, set out on such a dramatic change of IMF policy, which uh, was so uh, upsetting to very important European uh, shareholders without the full support of the Obama administration. I think that's a very interesting, uh, interesting turning point. So next round of questions. Uh, could I have a two hand on this, please? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I'll allow. Thanks. Quick. <laughs> Thank you. Um, by the way, this is where perhaps uh, economists and political scientists don't meet. Um, you know, you mentioned Russia, you mentioned, mentioned Argentina, you mentioned Greece. Fundamentally, economically, there was a similar problem in all three countries. The market perceived a strong possibility of a default. And the IMF bringing in a big rescue package meant that in the form of a liquidity injection to reserves was a perfect time, uh, and it's being seen as senior debt, was the perfect time for the junior bondholders, like the Russian treasury bill holders, to exit the markets. And that's exactly why the rates spike. So there's something, there's another economic backstory to this. By the way, there's also a backstory to the, to the Russian rescue package. Um, in 2001, Komi Karas and I and a Russian colleague published a paper in Brookings Papers on Economic Activity on why the Russian package failed. The analysis for this was done in real time before the package was implemented. And um, it took us three years to wait until we could publish it. Uh, it still created a lot, lots of problems. I have still to write that backstory. But the point is that from an economic perspective, um, you know, you, you it, I was surprised that you would say that the IMF imp Essentially, you implied that the IMF did the right thing on Greece, but it was exactly the same problem, bringing in senior money, official money, to bail out a country where there was a fiscal solvency problem, which was a time for the private sector to exit, and you know, not having the possibility of restructuring the official money, 
which really worsened the fiscal situation. So I'll just leave it at that. So I am, sorry, all these World Bank people asking questions. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, I'm always interested in the omitted variables when people tell a very consistent story. So I have two questions. Um, one is, um, what about the U.S. agreement to the, cap the recent capital increase? Um, the bank, they don't seem, you know, they, they did it in return for less lending to China. Okay, China was an enormous largest borrower of IBRD. And, you know, that seems in, eminently reasonable considering um, China's place in the world now. And the second thing was the perennial, um, you know, damping down of staff salaries, et cetera, which has already led to commotion there. So what, um, it doesn't seem to be consistent with the story of um, U.S. total neglect and withering away. And then the second, um, uh, omitted variable and then a very good analysis of the differences between the World Bank and Gavi is um, the other, um, the Global Fund, um, which has a structure that is remarkably close to the, to the Green Climate Fund, um, its board structure, and yet um, in all of the reviews of multilateral institution scores, um, as well as, if not better than Gavi, um, and certainly in the same range, all three of those institutions, the World Bank, Gavi, and, and GFTM are about the same. So is not the issue not so much that the World Bank is country-centric, but that these single-purpose um, global funds are, are highly convenient because the goal setting is um, basically completely with the donors in the beginning. The, the, they get, recipients get added on. Um, to the boards later on. So um, to my mind, and to, in that question about what does this mean for recipients, the, the proliferation of single, um, a, a single global type goods programs that are set by donor countries um, is really robbing whatever um, space of autonomy we have given in the last few years to recipient countries. Great, thanks. I saw uh, there was a. Oh, yes. I have a very quick question on that. Okay. Okay. Um, I had a question about development competition, and if you saw any sort of connection between the proliferation of institutions and playing into the competition that is very much U.S. and China based, are more organizations being formed as a result of China trying to exert its authority or its uh, rebirth on the world stage as uh, uh, an indicator of like it saying like I want to be seen as the new world rising power or the new power on the globe. Great, and in Durban. So I just have a quick question. I mean, it, it, it seemed to me from your remarks that you prefer cooperation over competition for these agencies and so on. I, I don't know if that's correct or not. But I remember that during the 1997-98 crisis when we asked the Brazilians if we should cooperate with, uh, if, if we should be talking with the, the IDB, right? We at the World Bank should be talking to the Inter-American <coughs> Development Bank and, and we should be cooperating with them. They said, no, we want you to compete with them. Why is it that you always ask us to compete with other countries and so on? But when it comes to you guys, you want to collaborate. Yeah. Okay. So um, Scott, can we start with you? I've, I've got uh, a couple of questions. So one on the development competition, and if more organizations are being formed in the competition between US and China. Um, in Dermot's question, which was just on cooperation and competition and what's a good or a bad thing around that. And then also, could you comment on the capital increase? I'm also going to turn to Christopher on the capital increase, but um, given your perspective as well, it would be good to hear uh, your input on the capital increase in the World Bank, and if that's not at odds with the, the narrative that we're telling. Um. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad um, someone raised that because it, it was, it, as I listened to the remarks, it's it, Certainly in, in my mind, um, because it is, a, I mean, I, I sort of had an instinctive narrative that is aligned with what I heard, but frankly, um, 
Uh, you do have the capital increase. I think, um, uh, and not only do you have a capital increase that the, this U.S. government um, supported and, and really was in the driver's seat uh, in, in defining, um, it's bigger than the one that we did in the Obama administration. Um, so, you know, I like to think at the time I was running around negotiating for capital increases, multiple replenishment. We had a huge amount of ambition for the MDBs, but look, uh, <laughs> this is a bigger capital increase. And not only that, um, but the policy framework around it, as I read it, is a, is a pretty reasonable and constructive one. Um, they did not, um, while the administration itself will say, well, we got a deal that that gets China um, out of borrowing from the bank. They didn't get that at all. Um, they got um, a framework that is a reiteration of the current policy, which emphasizes that it's the country's decision whether they will borrow or not. Um, so, you know, I like what I see uh, in many respects. Now, uh, you know, I don't think it's all good news. I, I do think the IDA replenishment is going to suffer in terms of the U.S. contribution. Um, I do worry about that, um, but. I don't think, um, frankly, I, I just don't think we can say at least this U.S. Treasury has neglected the World Bank by, by any respect. Um, on um, competition among these institutions, you know, I think there's there's sort of dumb competition, and then there's some that's, that probably have, have that. Um, you know, they shouldn't be competing on, on financing terms, uh, and yet some of them do. Not the core MDBs, but, but others do within the system. Um, but there are ways in which, um, you know, there's sort of a, a sense that the World Bank is the leader and they all follow. Um, but in a more competitive model, we can look to any one of these regional institutions to be the source of some innovation uh, that can be adopted by others. Um, and to some degree, that kind of innovation comes about from a sense of, of competing, um, both for their client countries, but also in demonstrating to their shareholders more broadly that they are vibrant institutions where a lot of good things are happening. And I think that, you know, that happens in an environment where they're not just viewed as cookie cutters. Mm -hmm. Christopher, do you want to take yeah, the capital increase as well? Um, so I think that's a great question. And actually, uh, I got that from when I had a blog post at Brookings with much of this in there. And I got that the next day in my email from someone at IFC said, hey, how about this? Um, so I've given it a little bit of thought, and I agree that it's something of a counterexample, and I don't, I don't think we have a total explanation. Um, the, the discussion at the time was that Treasury was pushing for this, and so rather than it being something that was coming from high up, it was coming more from, um, from Treasury. But there are elements of it that you can see in line um, with the, the Trump agenda. So at the time, and, and, and still, the, the AIIB was figuring large, and this is a way to have the World Bank as a competitor to the Chinese-led AIIB. Um, it was also, uh, although as Scott just pointed out, didn't exactly limit, it in spirit said that we're going to wean the bank off of lending to China. And that's been a pretty important source of profitability of the IBRD, and then an important component of the funding model of the bank to be able to take those IBRD profits and use them to whenever the IDA replenishment isn't going to come up to snuff, they can stick profits from IBRD in there. Um, in addition, there were some other things about that agreement that would uh, uh, sort of undercut the World Bank's future and therefore maybe be appealing to the Trump administration. One of those being that it, the uh, US was uh, callable capital was moved to the end of the line. So other people's callable capital has to be, tacked, has to be uh, tapped first and then only would the U.S. become liable. That's likely to further undermine the, the World Bank in the eyes of the credit uh, rating agencies. So I think there, it's a mixed bag, and I don't think we can fully explain it with a simple story, but I do think that there are elements of that that were in line with this. Thanks. I, I think the only thing I want to add to that, because we haven't talked about it at all, is the diplomatic savviness of the leadership of the World Bank, developing some, some relationships that actually um, ended up being very positive in that particular uh, in that particular situation. But Sarah, we also had a question around um, the single purpose funds and the difference, or not very much potentially, between the Green Climate Fund and the Global Fund in terms of their governance and structures, and yet a big difference in 
in what has happened uh, in the outlook of those particular kinds of funds. So. Um, yeah. So briefly, I mean, I I actually don't think that the that the um, Global Fund and Gavi have very different um, board structures. So they both have representation by states, but also voting representation by non-states. So I just I was briefly looking it up because I didn't want to misspeak. Um, but the the board of the Global Fund is seven representatives from developing countries, eight representatives from donors, and five representatives from civil society and private sector. So those are the voting members. Um, so I think, so that is similar to Gabby, and, and there's no permanent representation for any individual country on the Global Fund Board the way that there would be at the World Bank where it's done by voting shares. Um, and so, so there are, I think, you know, I would actually lump it as closer to Gabby, but I mean, I think you, you raise a, a really important point about these single issue funds because I think this is very intertwined. I think it's the fact that these are single issue funds that, that makes donors willing to give up some of this control, willing to structure it to look like a Gabby or a, or a global fund and not like a World Bank. And so if you do try to make them too big, then you're going to lose that buy-in of, willing, of willingness to put these vote giving voting memberships to non-states and, and giving up the ability to have a permanent seat on something that we've seen in Gabby and the global fund. Um, if you try to become too big, states won't buy that anymore, right? And so it really is kind of staying focused on a single issue that the people that states can agree on is important and staying not so big that you attract too much attention where people want to jump in and influence you and, and, and secure their ability to influence you. Creating the agenda and the agenda system. I wanted to circle back to Indermet's point and Ryan's point about competition. And I think that uh, we've been banding about this word competition, but I think a lot of times it's actually conflict that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think that when it shades into conflict, that's when it gets to be unproductive competition. By that I mean competition is fine in terms of there are two entities that are striving for similar things and they push each other to do more and more toward that outcome. If development is really the goal, then that kind of competition between China and the US or between different institutions can be a very productive thing. But what I think what messes that up is the fact that these major donors are actually trying to serve national interests, not just development interests. And in that sort of issue, you have China and the US that cannot both win simply by creating good development situations because each is trying to come out on the top in terms of, of their own national interests. And so I think that that's when it becomes troubling, is when it's turning into a conflict that's not so much about the developing countries, but about a race between these two big donors. Randy, do you want a chance to weigh in on this last round of questions before we close out? Oh, just, I, I'd like to talk some more with Brian if we get a chance. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, I guess um, the, the point I wanted to make about Lagarde was just that uh, it was remarkable to walk away from the automatic posture of, of course, we'll participate, um, irrespective of whether uh, there's a substantial haircut or not. For the existing debt, right? that that was a that was a very unpopular position in Germany, and you now I think clearly she must have had some support from the U.S. administration when she took that position. Um, and I guess the, the I, I agree with your your assessment that these um, bailouts by the IMF uh, generally have the function of, of bailing out creditors, right? Um, and. Uh, uh, but, but when can you sort of conditional on that, when the bailout is made, if it is expected by private creditors to be followed by credible enforcement of conditionality, then it tends to cause the yields on sovereign bonds to drop and, they, and the, the uh, country continues to have access to capital markets. And when it's not credible, like in, in these important cases, then uh, it, it doesn't matter that the credit access to private capital markets still draw the, uh, dries up and you still get a, a collapse. Right? So you see that um, in, in Argentina and, and in Russia. So thanks very much. We're uh, just a few minutes over time. I want to thank um, all of the panelists, both for their thought-provoking openings, uh, because we, we hit a lot of different dimensions of the multilateral system. Um, as well as congratulate them on, on that provocation. Thank you for your staying power um, through the end of the day. I see one more thing, Tony, just to tell everybody that we're going to start at 8. We'll start with breakfast at 8 tomorrow in the Penn Pavilion, and then the session starts at 8.45. 
And if you come at 8 o'clock, you get hot omelets and stuff. <laughs> so, so 8, eight o'clock breakfast. We start at 8.45. Um, thanks very much for what's been a really rich uh, discussion. Thank you, Scott, for beaming in from Washington. Um, thank you for putting up with his big head. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to be able to haze you now for your big head for a long time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and have a wonderful night. Thank you, Tony, for keeping us all on track and uh, for provoking the conversation with some really um, great questions yourself. So.